And we do have an email from Jim in Washington, D.C., who says of the debate, style of questioning aside, many substantive questions were asked on bankruptcy, tax proposals, personal finance, incompetence, and on and on. And yet none of these non-answers from the candidates were pursued during the debate by the moderators or afterwards in the media criticizing itself. Lost in both was the empty answers that candidates used to evade questions. Olivier. Well, you saw that a little bit in the debate when <clears throat> at the end of Ted Cruz's peroration against us, and I I quickly add the media, we are uniters, not dividers. Everybody hates us. I sort of respect him for doing that. <laughs> um, but he'd been asked a question about his, about his position on, I believe, the debt limit. And instead, he spent his time weighing in against the media, which is, which is effective, but a little bit annoying if you want to know where Ted Cruz stands on the debt limit. And then at the end of it, he got huffy and said, you don't want, you don't want an answer to your question. Well, um, you just spent your allotted time under the ground rules that you agreed to uh, weighing in against us. It's your, it's your privilege. It's your right. But don't, don't complain about not being able to tell us where you, know, where you stand on the debt limit. Um, the follow-ups are always a problem, I think. In these, in these debates, because when you have uh, a platoon of candidates on that stage and they've agreed to um, a really complicated set of protocols for who gets to ask what of whom, how, how long, who can speak about what topic. I mean, my, my nine-year-old needs fewer rules um, <laughs> about what to say and when than, oh, you're lucky. than, the, than the candidates <laughs> do. Um, but so it's, it's an unwieldy structure. There, there are a lot of people on that stage. And all of this is happening months before we've even seen the first proper organizational test of these campaigns, and that kind of makes me a little crazy.